And uh, we are joined in the studio at this time by Michael Hughes and Colin Telford. Gentlemen, welcome along to the Carrick Fergus FM studio. How are you doing? Doing very well, Michael. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting us down. No, you're all right. Uh, it's a first real step into management for you. I know you and Steve Lomas uh, worked together in England, but taking over at Carrick Rangers, was it an easy decision or was it something you sort of had to go, here's my time? Uh, well, it wasn't really, here's my time type of a, a decision. To be honest with you, it was uh, it was a, a board discussion, and we got together, and uh, we I think realised or thought that a little change might help help the team, uh, and I felt that I would come in on a short term basis to try and uh, help out, whilst we tried to find someone else to maybe come in and take over. Uh, I asked Colin to come in and assist me. Uh, and thankfully he said yes, he's come in and he, he's, he's brought his experience, his four years in, in, in managing teams in the lower leagues and his contacts in and uh, we work well together. I'll, if I do step down, I would hope to persuade Colin to stay on uh, in a role at the club on the playing side. And we haven't had that discussion yet so maybe we can put him on the spot here today at some point. <laughs> thank him. No, we're, I'm enjoy we're enjoying it. It's, it's great to be involved with the team. Obviously, and that's not my Don't mind your phone there, Colin. That's a fine for... That's a player ringing us. Player, oh, player. Was it a player? Opportunity. Oh. I'll wait till he answers that. Do you want to take that one? I... It's my Rodonna coming out of retirement. <laughs> Messing yeah. back. It's available. <laughs> yeah. But it helps. The result, results have gone great for us. Uh, you know, a, a great win over at the distillery. And I, I would say it was a good point at the end of the game because we obviously came back from 2-1 down. Sure. But on the overall performance on Tuesday night, I think we were a little bit disappointed that they take three points because we played exceptionally well and the guys were outstanding. We've asked them to pass the ball and, and be a little bit more expressive in themselves and have a bit more confidence and ability and every single one of them has responded magnificently to what we're asking them to do. Now we know Michael Hughes the player, we know what to expect from you as a player, but as a manager, is your personality different? Do you approach things differently? Uh, I think I've been fortunate enough to, to be involved with the club now for a year and a half and, and basically I've attended a lot of matches and I know the strengths and the weaknesses of uh, the players, uh, obviously Stevie's players and of course it, it, would be, it wouldn't be right if I didn't go on record and thank Stevie for his time with the club's five years, he, he did uh, exceptionally well for the club. Uh, it was a real team effort last year to get us promoted. The board played a major part in it. We, we spent a lot of money and we put ourselves on the line and, and uh, we probably pushed the finances to the maximum uh, mm -hmm. to get the best players in last year. So it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a team effort, the board, the players, the management and everybody associated with the club last year to get us promoted and win the cup. But again, uh, Thanks to Stevie for all, for all he did, and the decision that we took was, was uh, wasn't an easy one. But we just felt that maybe if we changed it now, then it might, uh, might give everyone a little boost. Is it tough to come in in that sort of atmosphere? Because obviously Stevie was there for five years, and then you're having to be the guy that comes in right after Stevie. Did you feel a sense of pressure, or is it just something you get on and do anyway? Well, I think I touched on it there that I haven't had the year and a half to see the players and watch the players and get to know the players mm -hmm. and get to understand their personalities more than anything. That's maybe the most important thing, I think, managing and coaching people, players, whatever you want to call it, is you have to know them mm -hmm. and know what makes them tick and figure out very quickly how they are as individuals and deal with the individual and coach the player. Uh, they're all different. Some have strengths and uh, in, a, in a vocal sense where they would be you know they'd lead with their voice mm -hmm. others are very quiet but you know maybe they don't quite understand that they lead with their actions on the pitch so we're trying to identify and let them know that they're all they're all leaders they all have a voice they should all be confident in, uh, in their capabilities as players and I have to say they've given us everything absolutely everything they've left nothing on the pitch, they've, 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 they've just given us a hundred percent in both games, and they played some simply in football, you know. And it's been a, it's been a pleasure to watch. So uh, pressure, no, 
uh, and that's probably insofar as the fact that I could I can step out really at any point. It's not uh, you know I obviously want the club to do great and the team to do great, but it's 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 as I said it could be a temporary thing. So okay, if it's not going well, I can step out and say to Colin, there you go, you know, <laughs> something you know. But uh, so no pressure, yeah. more more enjoyment than anything else. We'll maybe come back to that if, uh, Colin, you're nodding your head there about the players giving 110%, the players uh, showing that they can really get down and play football, which is something that Carrick fans maybe haven't seen them do just as much as of late. Yeah. What would you attribute that to? Do you think it's just about changing the way they play? What have you noticed in training? Well, you know, for me, uh, first of all, I have to compliment Michael since he's come in. You know, uh, him and I have known each other for, for a long, long time. and. Uh, He's had a fantastic career and when the opportunity came along to work with him, uh, I couldn't say no to it. I left a, a very, very good football club in uh, the Amateur Premier League, but, but to come and work with Michael first and foremost, uh, to give him a helping hand uh, has been great. And I think his presence alone, just in the dressing room, has raised the players 15-20%, which, which has surprised both of us how they have performed. No, we've sent them out onto the pitch and, and we've tried to take pressure off them. Mm -hmm. uh, we've invited them to go and play, uh, give them the opportunity to express themselves. And, and to be fair, they've responded to that. And, and, and now, they're, they, on, on Tuesday night, they were disappointed that they drew 2-2 two -two with Porta Down. There was a change in attitude. Really, they like really, really were. And, and I think both of us felt the same as well. So to come from distillery, there was a, a 20 minute spell on the game where we sort of struggled, uh, we then went into the first real part. We passed the ball and we started to move it, and you just it was like a, the light bulb just come on, and the team responded to that. We got the goals in the, the second half, uh, and even at three two under pressure, we dealt with that. We got the result. We took that in the Tuesday night, and and the response has been uh, not saying su surprising, but uh, very very good now. Very, very good. And you have to say as well, I mean, it's clear to notice right away, there's a sense of player reward. You take the likes of Addis, who came off the bench, played fantastically well in that game against Lisbon Distillery, and then got to start the next game. Yeah, well, so they're being encouraged to go out and to do their best. Well, there was, there was no doubt for us when, when we seen Johnny's performance when he came on, that he was more than capable of starting the following game. Like it was, There was no selection issues with it. Mm -hmm. Stevie O'Neill got injured, Johnny came in. Uh, like, we, you know, we had... Uh, the big lagging was available to come back into the start in 11, but we felt confident to go with what we'd end it with. Worked out perfect for us, and then, and then for the big man to come on and, and get the equaliser for us, and the last, the last kick of the game really was, was perfect. When your phone rang and you saw Michael's name on it, what did you think to yourself? Did you think, oh, here comes an opportunity, did you think, oh God, I don't answer that? Uh, be honest. He's up in the money, I owe. Does he fancy a game of golf and lose a couple of quid? Uh, no, Michael and I talk about football all the time when we're together. I'm well aware of his position at Carrick. You know, again, he's done a fantastic job off the field. Uh, he's been inspirational since he's come in as, you know, let's let's say caretaker manager at the moment. For me personally, you know, I would hope that he, he'd want to take the role on and, and maybe see it out to the end of the season and decide from there. You know, that's that's entirely his prerogative. I would assume if a man of his experience will, if he wants to go into the management game, uh, you know, if his, if his management career follows his, his football career, then I think it's, there's exciting times ahead for him and, and, and hopefully he can, he can leave a great impression on Carrick Fergus first before he, before he maybe looks elsewhere. But that, let's get him settled here. <laughs> <laughs> let's get him settled here. Very good point and uh, just allow me to move the microphone back around you, Michael. Uh, you know, that was one of the things people had asked me to ask you as well. Having worked and played with the likes of Michael O'Neill, Ian Dye and Jim Magelton, have you a Northern Ireland manager favourite yourself? I, I don't have a favourite. I think all three of them are very capable and will do a, a good job. Uh, I think what's important is the three of them, are, they, they played for Northern Ireland and they, they, they know that it's, it's, it is a special, it's a special job and so far that we don't have a lot of players to choose from mm -hmm. and the guys that you do choose. Uh, you have to get them motivated. I haven't said that. I mean, having to motivate guys to play for their country, it seems like a contradiction in, in terms. You, you should always be motivated. And I know when, when 
when we played together, we were from the same era, era that there was no, no issue with that. Uh, it seems to have reared its head a little bit now where some of the players are being questioned and their attitudes are being questioned and they want to turn up and, and play for the countries. I like to think that the guys that haven't turned up have legitimate reasons for doing it. Mm -hmm. And probably like in our day, uh, was it club before country or was it country before club? I would probably say it was maybe country before club. Having said that, there's fast and so much money now in, 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 in the game and the guys are earning, you know, it just seems to keep going up and up and up. So it, it, it seems now that if your club career is jeopardised through playing for your your country, then the money comes first, it seems, which is understandable to a certain degree as well. So uh, maybe that's something the new manager would have to address first and foremost. Uh, and maybe try and cast the net a little bit wider to get more, more players into the into the squad. So you'd be happy with either of the three? I would be happy with any of the three, yeah. I think they're they're all good guys. Uh, I mean, in terms of experience, you'd have to say that maybe Ian Dowie has the most in terms of club management. He signed you at one point, didn't he? Yeah, I played with Ian at Crystal Palace and I, I, I was with him at Coventry. And I'd, the one thing I'd have to say about Ian is that his motivational skills are fantastic. Great motivator of people. Um, he believes in the message he's trying to get across. And obviously, he's got a good football brain, as he's talking about the football side of it as well. So. But I enjoyed my time with Ian, uh, and you know, when he came into Crystal Palace, the first thing he identified with us at the time was we weren't fit, or fit enough, and we had a month of really, really difficult training, you know, yeah. and at the time we were questioning it and saying, wait, do we need to do this is ridiculous, because we were going into games, the first four or five games when he took over, and we, we could sometimes barely move, uh, but it paid off, and we got fit and we got strong and we, we went in a run, I think we won our 18 of our last 19 games and eventually got promoted that season. Basically by getting fitter than anybody else in the league and adding that to the football side of it because we had good skillful players. And of course it didn't, it didn't do us any harm, Andy Johnson scoring 55 goals that season yeah. either, you know. But, <laughs> but uh, he knows what he's about, but I'd be happy with any of the three. You know, they're all very capable and I'm sure they can, all, they can, they can probably bring uh, their own individual stamp to it. Um, having that experience of playing and working alongside such great people, is there anyone who you feel has influenced you slightly more than others in the way you're hoping to do things here at Carrick? The, 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 the place and the team and the guy that maybe influenced me the most, funny enough, was when I moved to France. I went from the British game uh, back then, which was uh, has obviously moved on, but back then it was more more kick and rush and fight and battle and scrap and the football side of it, the emphasis wasn't on that, the emphasis was on we're fitter and stronger and all that. Physicality over skill. Physicality over skill, exactly, yes. In France it was totally the opposite. It was, you know, it was all about skill, skill, keep the ball, maintain possession, don't give it away. Mm -hmm. And I thoroughly enjoyed that. It was played at a slower pace, but we were probably fitter if... You know, we were probably fitter than the, the British the British guys at the time because of how we trained. It wasn't as intense, it was slightly different, but you know, we never seemed to be as tired, I think, because we only played one game a week. But there was a manager there and he was like, he, at the time it was Gilbert Grace, he's a Swiss, he was in charge of the Swiss national team for a while and it was all like just attack, 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 attack. When we've got the ball, we're good enough to attack. I want you to keep it and pass it, and there would be literally spells and games when we would have the ball for two or three minutes. I would say that when we lost it, the other team could hold on to it as well for two or three minutes because they, they also were more technical than just as technical as us as well. So that influenced me greatly, and I have to say I think it improved me as a player by 30% going out there and spending two or three years out there. And I learned at the time very quickly that when you have the football, the other team can score a goal. It works, you can't beat that philosophy. And it is true, and the, the French, I think, uh, maybe that's why they were successful and more successful in history as well, because they do have a philosophy of football, which I think maybe the UK lacked for a while. Uh, and you know, they, they did try, but it was the sense of, you are right, that they kicked each other a lot more. There wasn't the same sort of, I don't know, the same 
emphasis on the right way of playing, if you allow me to put that in inverted commas? I think uh, it was just a, it's just an era thing, like anything else. I mean, it, it's no coincidence that the foreign guys who were starting, who came into the game, I mean, probably Cantona, I don't know mm -hmm. if you were at United. I was, yeah. yeah, he just arrived. Um, I mean, the guys probably looked at people like that, they are coming in and how they conducted themselves, you know, uh, the extra bits they did in training afterwards. And people, the young kids especially, would have said, I want to be like that. So they would have started to copy that. But all the, all the foreign guys who have come in to English football have raised the standard. And, you know, a lot of us say, well, it's not helping the young kids we're trying to bring through anymore. I, I go with the opposite. I say, well, it is actually because they're seeing these guys and it's raising the standard throughout. Mm -hmm. And the young kids have to be raised to that standard. They have, this is what they're seeing, the right thing. You know? Yeah, it's refreshing to hear that because, and I'll be interested to get your views on that as well, Colin, actually, because there's a sense sometimes in the media of you're almost afraid to say that things could be improved in the local game in the, in the UK because people have a very close-minded view of this is the way it's been done for a long time and that's the only way you can do it. But, I mean, you know, Michael's alluded to your experiences, obviously, over at United and stuff. You know, what are your views on it? Do you think there are things that we've been lacking in the United Kingdom that we've been picking up on recently? I think, I think the big thing in, you know, in, in youth football, and you know, I think this goes right across the whole of the UK, is, is the emphasis on winning. Everything's about win, win, win. Parents are on the line and they're shouting and they're, you know, and it's all about attacking the referee because he said the wrong thing. At the end of the day, you know, when the game finishes for a 10 year old kid, it's not about the winning of the match, it's about the enjoyment of the game. It's, it's been able to go out there and, you know, there's there's competitiveness now for different sports. And, you know, if I, if I play football, I want to enjoy it. Now, can I play in a team that loses and still enjoy a game of football? Yes, I can. And and I think the emphasis, yes, you know, where we're at now, you know, we're in the results industry. You know, we're here to win football matches, but we're also here to develop football players. And you talk about young Johnny Addis, if we can help to develop him and he has a, you know, I, could, I would say if you asked him, he's enjoyed himself the last two games and if you speak to the rest of the players, you would say that they've enjoyed themselves. That's very important too because that breeds confidence and the results will come off the back of that too. So, you know, the, the game, where is it at now? For, for me, Irish League football or even across the water, take it out of the, the top level of the game. Emphasis is, is maybe like I'm thinking of, of negatives that's going on at the minute. What Steve Keane's going through at Blackburn Rovers at the minute is just absolutely horrendous. Well, it's not right at all. You know, it's not it's not correct what what he's receiving. And and if you talk about Sam Allardyce, he got it at, at Newcastle, and then he came to Blackburn. And at the end of the day, football clubs have got to be realistic of where they're at and 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 see them grow. A short term fix and. And things like that. Michael Owen alluded to it actually, I think, the other day. He said it was almost as if the Rovers fans wanted the team to lose so they could yeah, get the king. Certainly, I got, I got the feeling the other evening when it was 2 0 and Blackburn scored to go 2 1. There's 20 minutes to go, and you're thinking, you know, you're thinking as a football person, yes, you know, I'm now supporting Steve King, you know, because I want to see him fix it. And and you get the vibe that the Blackburn Rovers fan are like, oh no, he's, he's you know, 2 2 here, what are we going to do? And, and I think I think the message is getting lost that football is about enjoyment first. And if you're a kid coming through, you want to enjoy the game first and foremost. And the winning will then come as an effect of you getting better. Will that be seen? And in terms of at Carrick Rangers, will your involvement roll down to some of the younger players as well, or is it primarily at the moment with the senior squad? I think we're very interested in what's going on through the whole club. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier today. We're going to go and watch the reserve team play. Uh, see him uh, tomorrow night and we're keen to see you know what players are there you know personally for me i want to give kids the opportunity i think i know michael's career started at Carrick fergus i think about we 15 years of age or something when you played in the first team and you know so to say that 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 we don't support that would go against what's actually happened here with michael as such so if, if there's kids out there and they want an opportunity i would i would believe you know, that, that Carrick is a great place for them, you know, and maybe Michael something, you know, he would like to say on that. Mm. Well, do, when I, we have a philosophy that's it's, it's, it's very simple, that from every team we have through under 11 up to the senior team, that there's going to be a certain state of play 
and that's ball into the ground and pass it to a man in the same coloured shirt. Uh, have respect for your opponents, have respect for the referee, have respect for yourselves all the way through. We're trying to build a football club based on playing football. Uh, now we've got a couple of exciting things in the pipeline. Uh, I'm can you divulge any of this? I can divulge something but it's, it's still very early but I'm sure that people involved wouldn't mind me divulging it at the moment because we're very close to trying to agree something and we're, we're trying to set up an academy for, for, for next season through the club. That'd be fantastic. One of the local colleges which is going to uh, encourage the boys from 16 to 18 to continue on an education uh, whilst getting a couple of hours of football a day and playing a match on a Wednesday uh, in the mornings, then going to college in the afternoons and uh, doing work and hopefully getting the qualifications which will be the equivalent of three A levels. So we're, we're, we're quite far on with that and it's looking quite good and we hope to have that in place for the start of next season, the start of next school term uh, next year. So I'm very, we're all very excited about that. Uh, but it's all about the kids. It's all about the kids coming through, and uh, the more youngsters you can get and develop, and and give a career to, or give the opportunity. It's all about opportunity moving forward. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of work ourselves next year once we have our new facility. I think it's important that we don't forget the fact that we're going to have a brand new 3G surface, Carrick Rangers next year. We were going to put it on our own pitch, but. Uh, obviously we all know the story that the ground wasn't good, so we've moved it to the back pitch. So that's not gone away, that's still, we're still forging on with that. Okay. And there's going to be a fantastic facility there for all the kids in the borough, which is going to be a community facility. And it's going to be somewhere that everyone can identify with. This is the football club and this is the facility. And we want to get as many kids down there from as early as possible, playing football and enjoying what they're doing. That's a key factor as well, enjoying it, because there's always the risk of burnout with young players. Well, it has to be enjoyment, and it's it's no coincidence. And uh, I mean, Colin and I have both done our our, our, our A license, uh, and you tend to get guys who would come in and talk about the psychological side of the game and how you deal with players and how you don't deal with players. And I had one guy came in one day and he just said, "Leave them alone." Leave the boys alone and let them enjoy what they're doing. So the Brazilians do not coach their kids until they hit 13. Up until that point, they're left to express themselves and play football. Of course, if you can give a little pointer here and there, then it's, it's going to help me do so. But the key message that came out of that for me was these guys are allowed to, to find their own rhythm. They're not being told what not to do. You know, when you say to someone, oh, don't do it like this, do it like that, who's to say your way's better? Or that they will find their own way of doing it better in their own time. And Absolutely. This is something that stuck, it stuck with me, and it's something that I firmly believe in. And we're going to bring that forward. We will probably start around the age of 11 with our, we have an under 11 team who, 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 who we play in the league. And we will start probably around that age to try and sort of encourage them to play the game how we think it should be played. Uh, I think Con puts on a very important point about parents on the sideline shouting and bawling and it's a bugbear mind this because I've got two sons I stopped going and watching them play because when anybody in their team gets the ball they're hearing six different messages shouted from people on the sideline kick it, head it, get it out of play, put it up the pitch, pass it to someone now, in that split second that they have to make that decision on their own, they've heard six other people's opinion of what they should do. Mm -hmm. I, it drives me mad. Just be quiet and let them do what they want to do. You know, and let them enjoy playing. If they give it away, who cares? Doesn't matter. You know. So enjoy watching them play by all means, but let the coach or the manager or whoever's doing it on the sideline be the only voice that they hear. Were you lucky enough to get that sort of treatment or were you one of the kids coming through football that also heard the six parents shouting different instructions as well? It was usually my mum who was shouting the loudest. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> uh, yeah, she was quite a sporter and she had one of those voices that would sort of, you'd, you'd, one of those high pitched squeals that would go through you on the pitch. 
You know it was your mum. You know it was my mum. I don't. I think everybody else was scared to say anything when she was there. Can you remember that? You can remember that, didn't you? Oh, I could hear it. <laughs> so she would have been the most vocal. So I was quite fortunate that I didn't have to listen to anybody else, to be honest. Uh, but it, I no, I didn't actually, because it back then it wasn't taken as seriously. Okay. It didn't seem to be taken as seriously. It seemed to be a game of football that was to be enjoyed. Uh, now, for whatever reason. Uh, and it's probably a money aspect here that's because people can see the pound signs, you know, oh, I want my kid to do really well because then he's got maybe get a career in England and you can see this money. It's become, maybe maybe that's something that's potentially ruining the game, you know, at, at, at a younger grassroots level. Maybe it's not, I don't know, but it certainly seems to be a lot more serious than it was when I was playing most of six, seven years ago as a kid. I'm sorry, 26 cents. <laughs> but, uh, no, like I say, I just wanted to touch on that and say that, yes, we, we're we going to have a great facility next year and we are absolutely making sure that young kids and youth are going to get the chance and the opportunity to shine at our football club. It's very exciting news as well for young people, I'm sure, who parents are listening to this thinking, how do we get our kids down to it? Is there a way to apply or will there be a time they apply? I suppose it'll be after the news is confirmed. Uh, for the academy? Yes. For the academy, we're hoping to confirm that uh, probably early in the new year, first couple of weeks in January. Then there'll be a website up and running where you can uh, lodge your interest. Uh, obviously it will have to probably be done through the college as well, but all those details will be on the website. Mm -hmm. And we are talking about two classes at the moment, which would be, I think it's around 16, maybe 18 in each, in each class. So, uh, what's that, 30, 34, 36, 36 kids yep. uh, is what we're looking at at the moment. And uh, that's not to say if it's, if it's a success, success then can be expanded later. expand on that and, and have greater numbers. But what is, what is exciting about it is this is going to be the first academy in Northern Ireland which is tied up with an Irish League Premier Club. And Carrick Rangers are going to be part of that. with. Shows the, shows the intent as well, I suppose, because a few people looked sceptical when you said you want to get Carrick Rangers up to a European standard. You, you did, you know, you said you want to get them into Europe. Who was sceptical, Michael? <laughs> you, you know, you can say that to me, but you know, you know there were a few. There were a few, of course there were. Uh, and So this news will be of interest to them in particular. Do you know something? I don't really care about them. That's what I wanted you to say. Too much. I'm really glad you said you that. Know, we have a very uh, close knit group of people and I include all the supporters and I, I like to give the supporters a mention by the way because Do. they came out in force uh, at Lisburn and they supported the team to the hilt and they were fantastic and again on Tuesday night they came out and I know it's difficult in the current climate where there's not too much money about and the supporters are coming out and they're paying the £10 to get in and watch the games and following their team. But I'd just like to say that it meant a great deal to me and Colin and all the players for their support over the last couple of games. And it's that's another factor that the guys that push the spurs, spurs the guys along. It's great to hear your own supporters behind you and believing in what you're doing and encouraging you. Because encouragement is a big word that we're trying to get into the guys' heads. Encourage, encourage each other. And you know, when you're also getting encouragement from 200 fans who outsung distillery when they yeah. the home team you couldn't hear the distillery fans i have been getting messages all week from people who were so proud of that fact as well and rightfully so proud of that because they were they were doing really well to outvoice the distillery guys especially away from home they were and i think it's you know if they can keep that up for us until the end of the season and keep behind the guys mm -hmm. no matter what happens you know if we're, we've got off to a good start and you know who knows Maybe we will win every single game from now to the end of the season. However, that's unlikely. Uh, so whatever happens, get behind the team, keep behind the team, and keep encouraging the team. And, uh, and in a few months' time, if you're doing well, will I be still speaking to Michael Hughes, manager of Carrick Rangers? You may well be. You may well be. It's for me. It's it's. I'm really enjoying it. I'm really, really enjoying it. Uh, I didn't think I would enjoy it quite so much. But I mean, the first couple of 
nice training we had. Was I thoroughly enjoyed working with the guys on the pitch, and I think what makes that more enjoyable is the fact that the guys are responding to what we're asking them to do, and also, of course, winning the or winning the first game and, and doing so well in the second game it is the icing on the cake. Of course, it is, but it's uh, you know it's it's quite nice when you're asking someone to do something and you can see that they're listening to what you're asking them to do and they're taking it on board and they're going out and they're doing it but also that it's working, it's successful uh, which is important Which is important. Now, of course, when a new man comes in there's always a reaction and there's always a good reaction you always tend to get a, you know, a couple of good results on the trot so uh, we're not looking into it too much and we're not overreacting and we're not saying that we're some sort of unbelievable messiah who have come and turned the fortunes around because that's not how we see it. The only thing that we're asking the guys to do is to go out on the pitch, express themselves, play with an enjoyment, pass the ball and give us an improvement on performance. And that's it. If we get an improvement in performance and lose matches, if I step down from this role, I can say, well, they played 10% play better than they were. So my stint in charge was worthwhile. It's a good point. And uh, just before we close, Colin, I'd like to ask you, if you had a Christmas wish for Carrick Rangers, if you'll allow me to be festive, <laughs> if you had a Christmas wish for the club in a few months' time that maybe could come true, where would you, where would you see the club or what would you like that wish to be? Uh, for well, you to still well, have a job. I think I think if you I think if you touch on the supporters there as as Michael uh, as Michael mentioned, I think there's there's one thing you know when when you leave every game you feel as if you've been entertained. Uh, you know, realistically we're not going to win every single game, but we can perform well in every single game. Uh, so if the supporters look back from Christmas. Uh, from, from, you know, from now to the, the end of the season and they're looking back and they turn around and say, I tell you what, we, we really enjoyed that and there's an appreciation there for entertaining with results, you know, good energy around the place, the players look happy, there's, you know, there's good team spirit in the place, the fans feel connected to the players. So, as, like, as Michael says, you know, we may put 11 players out onto the park, but there's a whole backroom staff involved in that, there's a board of directors involved in that, there's supporters involved in that and, and I think if we can help to bring everybody together and we're all going in the one direction, that, that probably would be the, the icing and the cake for us, to, that would be the big reward and obviously you know, progress in the Premier League and, and hopefully we can, we can finish not in a relegation battle and, and you know, with five, six, seven, eight games to go, we're pushing on here and going, hey, we could finish in the, in the middle of the league here. It's, an objective. It's, a, it's a good Christmas wish and it's, it's feasible as well. What about for you, Michael, on closing? What, what, would, your, uh, what would your wish be? For Kai Rangers? Absolutely. Uh, or for yourself, if you want to tell me what you want for Christmas, we can, we can go there. Oh, how long have you got <laughs> for that one, Michael? I, I, for Kai Rangers, it's, I think the club's been, for the last 10 years, and I think it's, it's also worth mentioning, the guys on the board, you know, that deserve a real mention, David Holdish, Mo, Mo Patterson, Ernie, you know, Ernie McCormack, and uh, Jim the Mayor, as I like to call him, <laughs> the Mayor of Carrick, Jim. The, they've done a fantastic job behind the scenes at the, at, at the club, and it's not easy to run an Irish League football club, it certainly isn't, because I'll tell you why, a lot of the time you're sticking your hand in your pocket to keep the club running. People don't realise that as well from an outside perspective, that, that is an element. That's an element. I mean, we're not here, the club isn't flush with cash, we can't go about throwing money around. It's not like that. I mean, especially last season, it was a case of all five directors putting their hands in their pockets at the end of the week to pay the players' wages. It's a little bit different now because there's a salary cap in place and you have a certain budget you have to stick to. So the IFA came to us at the start of the season and they said, Based on your income, this is what your salary cap is. So they give you a salary cap, uh, and you have to stick to it. Because if you go over that, it can be automatic relegation, or you can be deducted points. So you're not allowed to go over the cap that you're given. 
just so happens that the cap's probably just about right for us this season, you know. Uh, it's not huge, but we can compete on it, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, so I, I, I think these guys deserve special recognition for the part they played in the club long before I, I got there. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to think that maybe I helped a little bit when I came in, but uh, it wasn't. It's not. This is not down to me or the club. This is down to those guys more than anybody, and the supporters who also uh, run fun days and, 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 and put money towards the club as well. But the wish is. I suppose I, I would like us to stay in the league, you know. Uh, you want more than that, though. I can see that you know, that's, <laughs> that's you being a wee bit modest there. You want more than that. I don't want to say too much just in case it backfires on us. But <laughs> I can, I'm just looking at your face as you said that, and you, you're more ambitious than that, I think, I think Michael. I have the real ambition and a real determination to get this club up the league. Uh, I don't care how long it takes. Uh, it could take. Years. That's a point as well. But we'll get there. And I think one of the f fear factors for many people is the fact of, and I don't like using the word relegation, uh, but we have to be realistic and say that it's a possibility. Uh, although we don't think it'll happen, we can just never know. It will not finish what we've started because, you know, next season we can bounce back from that. And get back into the Premiership again if we do it. So nothing's nothing is going to change as far as the, my ambition for this football club. Uh, we'll push on and we'll push on and we'll push on. And to all the guys that said that we'll never qualify for Europe or whatever they said, I sat with a spirit of 76 with a 76 team four weeks ago. And we had a big dinner. I was at it. You were at it for the guys. Yeah. And I sat there. And these guys came in, they all got applauded at the team that came in and they, what they achieved then was absolutely unbelievable. It was it's incredible what that 76 team achieved. Uh, and I sat there and I thought, you know what, I would like to produce a team that goes down in history like this team's gone down in history. And that spurred me on a wee bit more to realise how much it means to people, football and people, it brings people together, you know, and everybody loves football, I mean you have 20 kids in the street, boys and girls, and they're all bored, bring a football in and throw it down in the middle of them, and they'll all be running about for the next two hours chasing it around, enjoying themselves, but uh, yeah, I, we, not just that, we have a real ambition, a burning ambition, to do well, and I want to be challenging for cups. I want to be challenging for league titles. What's? Well, it's not beyond anybody. Why is it beyond people? Why do they say oh, you can't do it? Why not? Why can't we do it? You know. See, I knew you were ambitious. I'm sitting in front of you, and I could just tell. I, there's no <coughs> way. There's no way after all this time you're going to go. Do you know what? It doesn't matter. There's no way. Can I just say something? <coughs> the, as far yes, you can. as far <laughs> as where we've come. And how far we've come in a year and a half as a football club, as a community, and the facilities that we're going to have in place next season. Let's not under, let's not, you know, just accept that and say, well, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of hard work's gone into this club now for a lot of people to get us to where we are now, mm -hmm. and that work's continuing. You know, we aren't settling for for what we've done in the last year and a half. We're not selling, we've got big plans and uh, things that I can't go into now. But you can bet your bottom dollar that every few months there'll be some more news, good news, coming out of Taylor's Avenue. And, uh, you know, I want to see more kids coming to watch the team play. I want the parents to be bringing their kids down to watch the team play. Uh, and we want this football team and this football club to be the hub of this community. And everybody's welcome. Super point to close on. Michael Hughes, Colin Telford, thank you very much for your time. And the supporters put me up to this one. Would they, would they uh, get a wee song on the radio? I said, okay. I said, what would you like? They said, The Wonder of Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Elvis? <laughs>